Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Louise Dacre from Rubicon Heritage. We're a, a commercial archaeology company, and my colleague Margaret Collingwood is a member of a, a local history group, um, the Liberton, Greater Liberton Heritage Project. Now, Rubicon were delighted when we were approached by Margaret Collingwood to become involved with investigating the chapel site at Bridge End. Uh, it's located on the old Dalkeith Road in Edinburgh. <coughs> This is on the south side of the, of the city. Margaret and the Greater Liberton Heritage Project have been carrying out extensive research, historical research, on the site at Bridge End, and they found historical references which show that a chapel was constructed in the Bridge End area at the beginning of the 16th century. Cartographic evidence shows that the chapel was located within the disused farmsteading of Bridge End, and it suggests that the remains of the medieval structure were upstanding at the time the first edition Ordnance Survey map was surveyed in 1852. Um, here we have a, a reproduction of a small section of the map, and as you can see very clearly, um, I'm just pointing it here. This is the farm building, one of the farm, the farm house which is upstanding, and in the front area here there's a courtyard of um, what were in use as farm buildings there and you can quite clearly see the remains of the chapel are, are noted. I'm going to pass over to Margaret now, and she's going to lead you through the research that the, the Greater Liberton Heritage Project have carried out, and then I'll come back and go through what we found in the next few Thank you. Good morning. Um, my group was looking at the... Oh, gosh. I've managed to do the wrong thing, of course. Here we are. Technology and I are not friends. Um, my group was looking at the history of the whole of Bridge End and finding the chapel that took over, so everything then focuses on the chapel. And in this picture behind me, I'm showing a picture of about 1900, and the area in the front with the two ceiling, the two roofs here, that's covering what I claim and what I know it is in fact the remains of the chapel, but that's not the original roofing, you'll see the significance of saying that later. The research that I was doing started off with taking the oral tradition and ask anybody who lives or has lived in Bridge End, and they will say with pride that there was once a royal chapel there. And that is just constant. When it comes to the books, then we have the first book that mentions this that I have access to is the Reverend White's Annals of Liberton, and that was 1792. Now that's way after the Reformation, and he says within that the building which had been the chapel, which he says was built by James V, and I've given the dates of James V there, um, he says that that is now a stables. But within that stables, he points out that there are niches where earlier on there had been um, religious statues. And then moving on from that, we also have the estate plan, which was from uh, 1794. And on the estate plan, uh, which I've blown up here, it's showing very much what Louise has just shown to you. And here we have um, the house. This building here no longer exists, but this one here is the one that I claim is the chapel. So that structure was there in 1794. White said that it had been the chapel and was then the stables. And if move on, the next bit, which was actually a crucial piece of research, was I found the Ordnance Surveyor's notebooks, and they were written around 1854. And within those notebooks, they too refer to a building that had been a chapel. And they say it's now a labourer's cottage. Uh, it subsequently went on to become a buyer and a pigsty, so it had quite a, an agricultural life. But they also say that the chapel at Bridge End is similar in size to the one that was built at Craigmiller Castle. And the one at Craigmiller Castle was built around the 19, uh, 1520s, and the National Archive of Scotland suggests it might have been about 1523 in some papers there. So it's similar in size to the one at Craig Miller, and this is Craig Miller Castle Chapel as it is today. And you can see looking at that that there's two distinct parts to it. There's a chapel, it's 
proper and a smaller part at the end, which is the chancel for the priests. Um, I measured that, pasted it out, and then went back to Bridge End and pasted out the one there. And the two sizes are very similar. And so too is the construction, but it's two parts. But if you look at the gable ends here, you can see how steep the roof was, which is not the roof that I showed you at the beginning. This is the current existing gable wall at Bridge End. And the, the part on the right, which is smooth without the white, that was actually restored by some council apprentices who were being taught pointing buildings. And the white part is the part that's the original. And you can see that that's a flat edge for the roof to go on and not the same as Craig Miller. And Louise will pick up on that later. Having gone through that and been convinced that that was the chapel, the piece de resistance came from one of my colleagues, Alison MacDonald, and she lives in the National Archive, I'm convinced. She found in the Craig Miller papers a Preston Charter. Now, it's in Latin, but it conveniently came with an English synopsis. And the English synopsis says that Sir Simon Preston of Craig Miller built at Bridge End a chapel for the soul's health of James III and James IV. And he paid for a priest to say masses for their souls, so it was a chantry. Now, he's specific that it's 1518, therefore it was not built by James V. He says he built it. James V was playing with medieval Lego at the time because he was five. Um, so in this, with this convenient translation, we now can say there was a chapel at Bridge End. It was built in 1518, and we know by whom. And we also have the surveyors telling us it's very similar to the one at Craig Miller Castle, which was built later and probably by the same person. So a nice little touch that came after that is when I was interviewing the last farmers of Bridge End Farm, uh, Harry Darling said, oh, and I've got the font in the garage. <laughs> and he went into the garage and produced this medieval font that he had saved from the building. It had been found in a pigsty. It was painted white, and he took the white off it. I took that, a photograph of that, um, around, the Royal Commission wasn't terribly interested, Historic Scotland wasn't interested at all, but fortunately John Lawson recognised it as a medieval font. And um, from that I persuaded him to come and look at the site, and what he then said was, I needed a, a professional survey. So then it was passed on to Rubicon, and I'll hand you back to Rees. But just to say that that font is now in the Museum of Edinburgh. <laughs> As Margaret mentioned, uh, we initially carried out survey work and map progression, and this confirmed that some of the buildings within the farmsteading had been upstanding since at least the time of the estate map of 1794. The survey work being carried out. The structure identified as the possible chapel had been extensively altered when it was in use as a farm building. Um, and this can be seen from the elevations that we have from the survey. You can see here on the northwest facing elevation, there are these ventilation holes which were put in when it was in use as a farm building. And all of the masonry above that has actually been added onto the, to the wall head. You can see there are various openings um, in the walls. And there are some openings which have, there's an older doorway here which is blocked up. You can't really pick it out in this slide. Um, and a window which has been blocked up. This is a very modern opening which has been put through for access um, when it was in use as a farm building. So although there may be some um, original masonry of the building there, there has been extensive changes throughout its, its time in, as, a, as a farm building. Um, the other thing that Margaret was pointing out, the roof line has been altered and on the gable wall we could just pick out a um, pitched roof line coming through here, which um, shows that the, that the roof was significantly different in the past. Now, some of the features that we identified shows quite close cor correlation with those um, in Craig Miller Castle as well. We have a door opening here on the left in the structure at Bridge End, and a doorway in a similar position in Craig Miller Castle. Um, and you can see their similarities in the construction. 
Following the survey results, the Greater Liverton Heritage Project applied for, and they were granted funding by the Sharing Heritage Lottery, um, the Sharing Heritage Lottery scheme through the Heritage Lottery Fund. And this funding was granted to carry out community excavations to look for some evidence which might give us clues as to the, as to the use of the buildings. Now, I'll run through what we were sort of hoping to find, maybe some datable pottery, um, or other datable finds that would give us a, an idea of the base of the building. We were maybe being very hopeful that we might find um, some human remains there. Uh, and maybe even more hopeful that we might find some kind of floor surface on the interior of the building, which, um, which would give an indication as to its use. Now, we had quite a bit of media interest during the excavations. And I think the next slide would be more far-fetched. We, we reported that we had indeed found a temple at Bridge Inn. Um, unfortunately, no such thing. Uh, here we have a plan of our trench layout. And you can see again there is the farmhouse on this side of the courtyard. The old Dalkeith Road is the point here. That's one of the main roads into Edinburgh. And the farm buildings forming the courtyard in front, in front of the farmhouse. And this is the area that we're interested in here. Our trench, um, one we put in the interior, hoping, as we said, to find some kind of original floor surface. And we extend that, we extended that right up to the wall and hoped that there might be some data evidence in the, the construction cut. Um, the rest of the trenches around the outside, we're looking for deposits or archaeological features around here. Now, unfortunately, um, the, there wasn't access into the, the area um, within these disused outbuildings. There was a very thick concrete slab and we, we couldn't get the machine in to open that up, so we had to very quickly abandon <laughs> trench five, but we, we enlarged the other trenches to, to take account of this. Trench four, when we started the excavations, we took, there were square sets forming the, the surface of the, of the farmyard area when we came onto the site. And very quickly, when we'd opened that trench, we found there was a, a modern drainage pipe going through, which provided the, the drainage for the, the courtyard. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have any archaeological remains in trench four. This is the site when we first arrived, um, just showing you what kind of state it was in. And as you can see, the north the northwest here, there was a fair amount of cleanness to do before we even began the, the excavations. And this is the site when we'd finished the cleanings and just begun the excavations. You can see we have trench one. Trench one is inside the chapel here, and the other trenches in the areas around the outside here. Now, the first day on site um, was a bit of a mixed blessing. Uh, as with all good archaeological digs, we had a, a fair amount of rain. In the, the morning we were able to, to get a fair amount done, but in the afternoon in the rain, um, started and, and stopped us working. Um, but during the, the excavations in the morning, we had recovered some Scottish post-medieval reduced ware and some Scottish white gritty ware from deposits within the trenches. And this very early on, this is showing that we have activity in the vicinity um, from as far back as the, the 13th or 14th century right through to the early post-medieval period. And this includes the period in which the chapel was constructed. We were very fortunate that members of the Greater Liberton Heritage Project and other volunteers from the community came out and, and helped with the excavations. And here we have some of the volunteers washing and cataloguing some of the finds. And there is some of the pottery that was recovered, some of the white ware and the, the Scottish post medieval reduced ware, and also some later pieces as well. We were very fortunate also that um, some of the other some of the other volunteers were happy to be involved with the excavation. That's some of our junior team. And then we have another slide here of uh, some of the Greater Liberton Heritage Project helping with the excavations. And Margaret, in the thick of things there in the middle of the slide, um, carrying on with the excavations. Some of the, some of the volunteers also had prior archaeological experience, which was great for us because they were very confident and competent with other tasks, such as planning. Here we have Jill Strowbridge um, planning one of the trenches. And this is a quick slide. One of the, the members of the group um, drew up the plan at the top, showing a chapel in our nice yellow porter cabin there. And this was used for a, a group of scouts who came out to visit. And we gave them a bit of a, a treasure hunt where they had to find 
some of the architectural features and plot them on the, on the plan, and then also find a few characters who were hidden around the place, as you can see. So now I'll go on to actually what we, what we did find in the trenches. The trench here is on the interior, interior of the chapel, and you can see um, the wall of the chapel, the gable wall has come down here, and this is the other wall that's coming across this area here and looking out into the courtyard. And you can see we excavated down to the foundation course. The foundation course steps out slightly. Um, and unfortunately, the construction cut was the wall built very neatly into the construction cut, and there, were, there was no dateable evidence came out of the construction cut. So that was a, a bit of a shame there. Um, we also found within this trench there was a layer of sand which was um, just ab above the level where the, the, the wall started, the foundation stopped and the wall started. And this looked as though it may have been a bedding layer for some kind of a floor structure in the initial use of the building. Now this was, it wasn't um, visible over the entire trench, it had been taken out in parts when whatever had been sitting on the bedding had been removed. And on top of that were a number of levelling deposits um, and further floor surfaces from when the building was in use as a farm building. I'll move on now to the exterior. This is trench two, and you can see we're looking in. This is trench one in here with the wall coming through this area. And in this, this was a trench which had yielded quite gritty wear and the, the Scottish post medieval reduced, reduced wear also. But this is one of the earlier features that we found in this trench. It was a, a stone-lined well, and unfortunately it had been truncated by two 19th century drainage pipes, you can see them running through, and they still provided drainage for the, the courtyard, so we weren't able to, to remove those. Um, so we could only partially excavate this feature. It was circular in plan and constructed of sandstone with lime mortar bonding. Um, it had an internal diameter of about 65 centimetres, and ex the external diameter is likely to have been around 1.6 metres. It was excavated to a depth of around half a metre, um, and at that point the, the water table in this area was very high and the water was actually sitting on top of where we, where, where we had excavated down to. Now, unfortunately, the stratigraphic relationship between the well and the adjacent wall had been removed by one of the 19th century drainage pipes, and while, that, while we didn't have the, the relationship in place, the dimensions of the well do suggest that the wall postdates the, the well, so this could be a fairly early feature on site as well, if we're correct um, in thinking that this could be the remains of the chapel. Now, um, because the water table is so high in this area, if we do get a chance to go back and do more excavations, then this would be a, a great feature to, to do a bit more work on. Um, the preservation of, of, of remains within there could be very good. Um, with the way the pipe truncated it, all of the deposits from the interior of the well that we excavated were in fact the, the fill of the construction cut for the, the modern drainage pipe, so we're, we're rather unfortunate in, um, in that. Uh, the last trench that we excavated was trench three on the exterior of the building as well. And this was very different to the, the other trenches. We excavated this trench down to about one metre. Um, and it was very different in character. Down at a metre's depth, there was a layer of trample, which looked as though there was a surface even at that point. And within the trench, we encountered another three different ground surfaces. The layer near the bottom contained Scottish post-medieval oxidised ware, and this is likely to have been of 16th or 17th century date, and so we're looking at fairly late deposits in this area, um, even at that depth. Now, the deposits in this trench, they also yielded um, residual roof tiles, which are possibly of medieval date, and within that trench we also had um, redware floor tiles coming out, which might possibly have been utilised in the interior of the building and they're on um, a medieval date also, and they indicate a, a, a structure of fairly high status in the area rather than just farm buildings, um, as, do the, as do the roof tiles. Now this keyhole trench, it provides a, a small glimpse at what was happening in the area, and it shows that there's been substantial change in the ground level within the courtyard um, and in the area in general. 
and we would have to re-excavate a, a slightly larger area to be able to, to give us a full picture of what was going on. So overall, from the results that we, we've gained, we've confirmed there was activity in the area in the period during which the chapel was constructed, and we also have earlier activity dating from the 13th or 14th century. And we also have structures which could predate um, the, the possible chapel. Some of the, the tiles, the roof tile and the floor tile, which we've recovered, also shows that there's a building of fairly high status in the area. So although we can't conclusively say that it's a chapel, there are quite a few things pointing to it. And we also identified the products which, um, which were giving us information about the use of the, the area as a farmstead in the post-medieval period. So where from here? Well, there was a huge amount of interest in the excavations from the local community. The site itself is on the edge of the Craigmiller um, Castle Park, and so we had a lot of interest throughout the week, um, a lot of volunteers involved, and here's a, a slide of the, of the open day that we had on the site. And we've gained a lot of um, knowledge about what looks like a fairly unassuming building, and people probably have sort of walked past it um, many times in the past and not considered the, the fascinating history that is there. Um, and the results show that we do have something, um, a, a building of fairly high status in the area, uh, looking at the, the floor tile and the roof tile which was recovered. And while we can't conclusively say that this building is this chapel at this point in time, it would be great to be able to go back and open up larger areas and try and, and really understand what is going on here. So I'd like to thank you all for, for listening. Thank you.